reason that measuring IT success is important as a topic in relation to your assignment is because it is one of the critical aspects of the assignment. It comes at the end of the assignment and is that last section. And historically, <clears throat> a lot of second year students in your position have dropped a lot of marks because you forgot to actually think about that section properly. You haven't pulled together the threads that are covered in this particular little presentation. And because of that, you're going to lose something like 20% of the grade. Straight off, just like that. So have a look at, think about the concepts as we go through them. Discuss them with Winnie this evening in the workshop or on Friday at the workshop, depending which one you go to. And see how the ideas here allow you to get a good ultimate uh, as article written that can get you good marks. Now, you've already talked, understood a little bit about stakeholders and who they are. You've got some academic theory about stakeholders. And last week I mentioned that you need to think about the stakeholders in the, at the various levels who could be interested in your new IT service based on those IoT type sensor networks. So you need to think about who these stakeholders are and what they're interested in. And then you have to think about towards the end of your project, as you actually do a real project like this one day, how are we going to measure whether we achieved our objectives, whether the project, the service, achieves the objectives of the key stakeholders that you're going to use. And I like to use the example, for example, of, say, getting a Fitbit that collects lots of interesting biological data about you. All the time, it's connected to your smart device, your smartphone, picking up data every few minutes, every hour or so, or whatever. And then it can send it somewhere. So at the beginning level, the lowest level, there's you as a collector of the data who have an interest in a service relating to it. Because you can track you know, your heart rate, your blood pressure. You can track all sorts of other things. It could be your blood sugar levels, it, if you're a diabetic. It could be lots of different things. So that's you as a first level stakeholder. Then above you, you have a stakeholder who could be your doctor, your GP, or your practice nurse. So they could be interested in collecting your data and the data from others of their patients. So they can see what's happening both to you and the way you respond to medication perhaps, or lack of medication, and the way that all of their uh, diabetic patients are responding. So they can see a higher level. And then above that you've got hospitals, you've got the NHS who are trying to understand what's going on with all sorts of different Ill illnesses that can be tracked, monitored by using these sort of devices. And then above that or in parallel you've got academic and medical researchers in universities and in the big pharmacology uh, organization, big pharma as we call them, uh, who produce drugs. So you've got, say, four different stakeholders and you need to think carefully about, if we're collecting data from there, which of those various stakeholders are you, are you going to design your new IT service for? Then you can start thinking about, okay, for that particular stakeholder, what are the measures that are going to be important in relation to understanding whether they've got value for money, whether they're getting the value they expected from that service. So what are the measures? And then most other, just as importantly, how do we measure these measures, these factors? Some of them may not be entirely obvious, and you'll have to start thinking and researching. Now, we, <clears throat> I built this around 
For example, the service that comes from the university, you know, the Udo app. So I want to put it into a tech context that's kind of related to what some of you are doing, because how many of you have got the Udo app on your phone? A few of you, half of you roughly. Here are an all not quite complete list of all of the stakeholders involved in the Udo app. From you at the bottom at level, that's you, there is you to users, our IT services people, um, they're in the, on the fourth floor at the moment. The library is often affected because they provide some stuff uh, because you've got links to the uh, library services, the catalogues. You've got the bus companies who provide timetables. Um, they're the hosting organisation. There's a company that actually provides the app itself. Academic staff, people downstairs, the ground floor, student services, the student union. Even the accommodation providers, DRS, DRSL, have a, uh, uh, an input into this. So lots of different stakeholders are involved in the Udo app. So if you're trying to think about improving that app, you've got lots of different people involved. And you have to think about who you're really focusing upon. If I were involved with doing an upgrade to the Udo app, the first thing I would think about is the most important people are you guys. You're the guys who are using it, trying to make your life here smooth and easy. Does it really work very well, folks? No. We still haven't got it right three years on. I never use it. So. Let's think about the interests of those various people as an illustration of how you have to think about so many different things as you think about a service in relation to one or more stakeholders. For those per people who are actually providing it, you know, the people who will be hosting that IT service for you, for your uh, services for the assignment, all sorts of interesting factors. All sorts of interesting factors there. How available is it? I mean, for, at the moment, how many have been trying to, have, of you have got LinkedIn now? How many have been trying to use it today? Is it working? It's not working at all well today. It's very, very iffy and very up and down. No doubt we'll discover tomorrow whether there's a big denial of service uh, attack or LinkedIn just got their serv uh, servers up the creek. Who knows? But availability is really important to most people. If your Udo app doesn't work, it's probably irritating, particularly if you're trying to find the timetable, either for your lectures or for buses if you're involved and need to use buses. So is it available 24 7, 365? Mm -hmm. As a theory, and what's it practical? What's it actually available? So, LinkedIn is normally incredibly reliable. Today, catastrophe, since about, uh, about 10 o'clock, I think it was. Now, the providers are also kind of interested in some of the Standish Group aspects. On time to budget and delivering the expected functionality or delivering business value. You might also be interested, from IT services point of view here, how many students are actually downloading it? That's a typical uh, metric for uh, apps on smart devices. But you really want to know not the number who've downloaded it, but the number who are using it regularly. Because we know from lots and lots of research and lots of statistics that people download apps, particularly free apps, quite happily, They'll try it out and never use it again. Now, if you look at a, st a normal smartphone, you'll find probably 50% or, or higher of all of the apps that are installed have only been used once, and no, the user has never bothered to delete them. So you want to know about regular use as well as downloads. 
IT providers are also interested in the feedback. Well, sorry, no, I should say it differently. They should be interested in user feedback. Because that tells them whether it's working, meeting their needs or not. In today's environment where apps are being developed all the time and are essentially in a state of permanent beta testing, i.e. they're never the finished product, it becomes even more important. Because the, today, the approach is, oh well, if it breaks, we'll fix it in the next update cycle in a month. Have a look at the update section on your smart device. How many have you got hanging around since, or arriving in the last month? Probably three quarters of all of your apps have got an update. Do you want to provide an IT service with an app that has to be updated because it's broken every month? What's the message that that gives to your users? Does it give you an impression that you've got a competent provider or an incompetent provider? The user, whether it's a student or, whatever, or any of those stakeholders who are using the app, is the information up to date. How easy is it to use? We talked about TAM and UTAUT a few weeks ago. Think about those metrics as well. Human computer interface standards, uh, disability um, ideas, how easy are they for people who are blind or other disabilities to use these services? It's a legal requirement, folks. Have you come across the W3C criteria? Anybody shaking their head that they've not touched on W3C? But I am certain that Dennis has talked to you about them this semester, IT product design. Does it do what it's supposed to do? Sorry, there's a typo there that I've just noticed. Not does it so, but does it do what it's supposed to do? How many apps don't actually do what they're supposed to do, or bits don't do what they're supposed to do? They're broken. How often is it used? Where can it be used? Do I have to have Wi-Fi? Can it work off 3G or 2G connections? Or do I need to have seriously high bandwidth? As a user, think about the question, why does your user want to use it? Refer to UTAUT. And by the way, all the way through as you answer some of these questions, remember you need citations to support your analysis, your argument, the ideas. People who are affected or are owners, you'll see this several times, are interested if they're supporting the information in the system, how much effort does it take? You know, in terms of what you're looking at, <coughs> IoT based data, how much effort does your user have to go to to collect it and put it into the system? Does it flow naturally? You know, with Fitbits, Either it's connected to your smartphone, or it may be connected by Wi-Fi or Bluetooth to your PC when you get home. Do I have to do lots of things to make it chatter to the upload device? Or does it do it seamlessly without me even knowing about it happening? And in terms of if it's connected to my smart device all the time, have I thought about security? How many of you seen the uh, items recently about the Philips Hue uh, lights, which can be attacked or could be attacked, so that if there are a whole load in a city, about 15,000 in a city, they can all talk to each other, and if you subvert one of them and can control that light, you can control all of those lights across the city. Switch them on, switch them off, make them go flash, 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 blink, 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 close them down wipe them out. So do you want them to be trivial security or importantly hard, solid, robust 
security. Kind of related to the operational effectiveness. How easy is it to use? Again, I've talked a little bit about <clears throat> data interfaces. If you are connecting with other sources of data, not just the one that your IoT devices or sensors are collecting, if you're going to connect to other information, how up to date is that information? So if you're going back to the medical example, can we be sure that we are connecting the Fitbit -y type of information, say at the national health service level or the GP practice level, to the right person? So I've got the right data with the right medical records. Up-to-date information and your data interfaces. If you're going to su um, support the service with cloud-based information or cloud-based processing and storage, then you need to think very, very critically about security, about the load factors, resources, the service level agreement, which is the effectively your, the guarantee given by that cloud provider of how reliable that service is going to be, the times of day that it will be available, whether 24-7, 365, with 99.999% availability. Five nines is quite a decent level to go for. 99% availability is hardly worth bothering with these days, folks. That means one hour in every hundred hours, the system won't be available. So that's three and a half days a year when the service can't be used, when you think about it. Think also about ISO 27002, either the 2005 version or the 2011 version. They all cover the same sort of stuff. Other perspectives of other uh, stakeholders, providers, users. Now, one of the things about IT services is they should make life easier, quicker, simpler. Let's take that gadget as an example. It makes it dead easy for you to record your presence in a lecture or a seminar or a workshop. Easier and quicker for me because I don't have to go around with that little zapper and spend time zapping your uh, student cards uh, and so on. So from a data collection point of view, that's been a magical gadget. From almost other, all other perspectives, the system that comes behind that lovely little IoT-like gadget is not terribly effective. If I go into one of the options to monitor you guys turning up here, it knows we've got two lectures and two workshops, so that's four events a week. So it thinks you guys should have attended 32 times between the beginning of term and the end of last week. However, you and I know that actually we're only using one of those two lecture seminar periods and we're using two workshops. And you choose tonight's workshop or Friday evening's workshop, which means two attendances. So two times eight is 16. So it calculates on the basis of 32. I need to calculate on the basis of 16, otherwise your attendance records are catastrophically bad. Even for those of you who have attended every possible event you should have occurred, attended. So, and if I look at the first year students who now have their beautiful individual timetables and they're allocated to a workshop or a lecture by name, by session, if I do that attendance monitoring for <coughs> Intro to Computer Science, 176 students or thereabouts, I don't get 176 lines in the table, I get 521. Three lines for every single student. One for their workshop attendance, one <coughs> for their 
um, drop-in session attendance, and one row for their lectures. How's that going to help me? How is it going to help people like Jay, trying to understand how you're getting on and working out whether he needs to call you in, or well, me and him, call you in for a little discussion? So it fails badly on doing something useful for me. It will be providing some seriously misleading information to the people on the ground floor who are trying to monitor um, overseas students to see whether they're attending them bare minimum or the minimum is 95% or whatever that they're supposed to attend. Because the data is complete rubbish now. Because the whole thing has been designed not recognising how we're doing things. So it fails fundamentally to do what it's supposed to do even. How often do I use it? Well, you guys use it every time you clock in. How often do I use it? As little as possible because it tells me so little I have to do so much extra to readjust what it's really doing. And if I were to then look at the UTAET criteria, do you remember what those are? Does it make life easier? No. Do I have to use it well? Yeah. If I don't use it occasionally, I might have problems with the rest of the university hierarchy. I need to understand what's going on so I can actually protect you from adverse consequences because it's mis giving misleading information. Same set for um, all sorts of other types of uh, stakeholders. And the app provider, the IT service provider, these are some of the metrics that they're likely to be interested in. Now, from the project perspective, Standish Group give you some pretty good ideas. On time to budget, the useful functionality that delivers business value. Some nice, simple metrics. Any good project manager, program manager, should be able to pretty much confirm whether or not that project is successful in terms of development and implementation. In terms of thinking about the operation of your service, another criterion you've got to worry about are these five or six. So, as you look for collecting data off sensor networks, the IoT sort of devices, you want to think about, in terms of success, how many people are really going to take it up? and use it. Is it reliable? And we've solved the reliability problems of that connecting to the right module, but we appear not to have sorted out some of the other interesting things. So in terms of robustness, you might be thinking about what happens if you drop things, bounce things, drop them in water, um, what happens if they get near a, uh, some sort of a reader. So if you think about your credit cards, the, um, the, the Wi-Fi or RFID accessible ones, which are like your cards are there. And remember your student card not only does that, but it also operates various doors here. Now if you want to get out of the door down the stairs there, most of the time you will have to press the green button to go out and wave your card at the reader to come in off the staircase. If you've got looking at your credit card or debit card with one of those gadgets in, then you need to worry about can someone walk past you with a, one of those readers and actually take some money off your bank account? It is feasible. They can be read at that distance, if you have a really good 
uh, card reader. So how are you making that system robust against fraud, robust against security failures? If you're going to use Bluetooth-like connections between your Fitbit and your smart device, how are you making sure that that is really, really secure? Effectiveness, it does it properly and does the things it's meant to be doing and gives you value. Efficiency is in terms of does it do it quickly and with minimal effort. And TAM and AUTUT then have a look at the lecture series. Deck. You must, in your assignment, refer to these as well because they are critical in terms of how you understand how you can then measure whether the right stakeholders are actually getting value from and are using the service that you've designed for them. And the final section here, which you need, will also need to refer to in your uh, la that last section of your analysis, are those six questions from the Zachman Enterprise Architecture. Who, how, why, what, where, and when. And those will help you to think about some of these questions that you need to be able to get to, to uh, measure. So the first part of that section is all about which, justifying which of those factors you need to get measures for in relation to understanding the success of your new service. But you mustn't stop there. You must also think about how you're going to measure them. The project manager will have these. They'll have the Gantt charts. They'll have the completion dates. They'll have the cost estimates. They'll have the actual costs, the money numbers, the people numbers, and so on. So the project manager should have them. In terms of some of the operational factors, We know how apps and services, we often have feedback forms. How often do we just say, oh, ask me again tomorrow, don't bother me now, I'm not interested. But that's one of the techniques we can use as a service provider to try and understand what our customers, our users, our stakeholders are feeling about that service, about the app. Another way that people can do it is not just by those surveys, but also by social media. You can have, you can create your own uh, Facebook account or Twitter account to capture feedback, crowdsourced feedback from all those people out there who are using it. And that's used by a lot of companies. Yeah, you can do interviews, you can do questionnaires in the form of surveys. You can also actually measure the stats in the operational infrastructure, downloads, connections, off, uh, frequency of usage. There's all sorts of ways you can collect those data. But I want to see that. Because what, what this article is all about, this project is all about, that you're writing about for this um, assignment, is actually getting to grips with what you will have to do when you get out there into your job. This assignment is based in t almost exactly and entirely around what you will need to do in the future, effectively as a post uh, first of all as a design project, and then post implementation sort of review at the end. And really, what you're doing here is building the whole of your project um, strategy, so that when you go, if you want to make it work, you can just press the button and it will all flow through, and you'll get the feedback and everything else. So it's a full. Uh, sort of pre-project launch or uh, project launch strategy that shows exactly how you're going to design it, how you're going to find out what's necessary and then measure its success in the future. Laying the, the, um, laying the ground really for your post-imp reviews. <clears throat> TAM and UTAUT Typically, these are some of the ways that you can actually collect information.
So there you have it, folks. A quick understanding of all of the factors you need to be thinking about in terms of that last section of your assignment. Focusing it in that sense. In the broader context, what it's giving you is, the th you might say, the theory, the outline of understanding how, in the real world, you go about understanding the success of your own projects. Whether they are an ordinary build-a-system type project, or whether it's you're a small one-man band creating apps that go out onto the app stores of Google and Apple and so on. The principles of all of the lectures you've had from week one through to week nine now cover all of the steps that you will need to know about when you're out there in the real world. They're the steps you'll need to know about next year with your placement. And they connect to what you're doing with Dennis in terms of IT product design, which is all about the interfaces typically, and also what you're doing with Dave Vorhis and others in databases. All three of these se sessions this semester are all about what you will be doing in your placement next year and what you'll be doing once you graduate and get a job in the IT field. In the, in the data analytics type field, and so on. If you're moving into the field of analytics, <coughs> using your expertise in SAS or R or Watson Analytics, which you'll cover in your third year, all of these stages are going to be important. If you're going to go into analytics, more and more of the world of analytics is going to be based around crowdsourced information, big data sets, which are uh, publicly available, or you'll even be being asked to connect to IoT-based networks. Whether you go to Rolls-Royce, to their uh, organization which monitors all that data that comes out of the sky on the jet engines, or whether you work in, I don't know, in a, a county council or city council in the highways department, looking at the data that's coming back from people's smartphones that identify where potholes are. Now, you, you're going to be using these techniques from now on. And that's one of the reasons why we're using IoT-based sources of data for this assignment, because that's becoming so important in many, many organisations around the world. You need to understand where you're getting your data from, how you're going to collect it, how you're going to transmit it to the service centres, whatever the processing environment, and then what you're going to do with it, and then how you're going to feed it to the people who are going to use it to make decisions. So it's a real environment, it's a real practice for what you will be doing probably next year. Okay, folks. Right, don't go yet. 